I sent from, you know, a thousand to 5,000 sats to these people with my lightning node routed over Tor and nobody could do anything to stop it. And like, how are you going to stop that? You're not. And that, like digital value over the internet that can't be corrupted, that can't be censored, that can't be diluted, that can't be stolen from me mathematically. Like, good luck. This is the Blue Collar Bitcoin Podcast, a show where average Joe firefighters explore the most important monetary technology of the 21st century. We talk Bitcoin, we talk finance, and we talk shit. Today, Dan and I are joined by Dylan LeClaire. Dylan is a journalist for Bitcoin Magazine. He also runs his own consulting firm, 21st Paradigm. Dan and I were truly blown away by Dylan's depth of knowledge on economics and Bitcoin. I was barely tying my shoes at 20 years old, and this guy is writing in-depth macro econ analysis of long-term debt cycles. I guess that's why I'm a fireman. In this episode, we talk about Zoomer perspectives on Bitcoin, Ray Dalio, macro econ, dropping out of college, Bitcoin leverage, sovereign risk, and socialism. As always, you can follow us on Twitter at blue underscore collar BTC, or send us an email at blue collar Bitcoin podcast at Gmail. Hope you enjoy. All views and language expressed by the hosts and guests in this podcast are solely their personal opinions and do not reflect their employers or organizations they are associated with. Do not treat any of the content in this podcast as investment advice or as an inducement to follow a particular strategy. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dylan LeClaire, welcome to the Blue Collar Bitcoin Podcast, man. We are uh, stoked to bro down with you this morning. How are you? Thanks for having me on, guys. Doing great. Um, you know, just ready to, to, to shoot the shit about Bitcoin and, you know, the rabbit hole journey. It's an exciting one. Yeah. We were just, we just spent some time before we clicked record saying how aggressively this thing can just grab you. Um, I know you're, you've absolutely burst on the scene, but it has been like, when did you, let's go, let's start here just as a little background for our audience. When did you first hear about Bitcoin? And then when was your orange pill moment? Like at what point did you really start going down the rabbit hole? Yeah, I first heard about Bitcoin uh, or I guess like crypto at the top of 2017. Um, I'm like, let me think, like I'm, I'm 16 at the time <laughs> and my, <laughs> my cousin extended family uh, was, they like put a couple hundred bucks into some, you know, liquid shit coins. And I think they like, 10 hundred X or something. And it was just like peak mania, like, like on, I don't even know what the, these Dylan, are. what were your preferred shit coins? What were your shit coins of choice back then? I had a few, I can, I, <laughs> I, I was not in the game whatsoever. And I was just vaguely paying attention, but, um, my, my cousin made boatloads of, of money and then lost it all on like divix whatever the hell that is. So, uh, <laughs> even these you know, names, um, dude, just saying these, na- like once you kind of, get yourself righted. Like even saying the names of some of these shit coins again is like embarrassing. Yeah. Like I, I didn't even know anything. Like he also, um, there was a kind of a friend of a friend that had, uh, I don't even remember the name of this coin now, but it was looking back on it. It was just a fork of Bitcoin core, like the, the actual software to everything. And it was like, I think it was called like campus coin and it was pitched as like crypto for college kids. And like, this market cap of this illiquid shit coin went to like 10 million and like there was just <laughs> and they had like a solid bag of it and like you know it was probably extremely liquid but like it was just absolute mania like block folio going to the moon um and so like that was my intro to, to crypto and i like at that point i wasn't even paying attention to to finance or economics or anything um you know like i, I love math so um i guess kind of going a little bit further down the line when I was 17, 18 years old, junior, senior year of, of high school, I was trying to figure out like what I wanted to do, you know, per se. Um, and I didn't love science, you know, chemistry was like kind of a drag. So I was like, all right, well, I guess, uh, you know, we're, you know, try to apply this, this love for math. Um, so I guess business. And I, I started like studying up on like, you know, investing and I looked up Warren Buffett or like best investors of all time and tried to figure out what they were good at, you know? And so like, went down somewhat of like a value investing rabbit hole um, and like just legacy finance stuff. 
Um, and at the same time, like I, you know, crypto, I guess like was just kind of there. Like I didn't, I didn't dive in, but I didn't like dismiss it. Right. Like digital money just made sense to me as an 18 year old, 17 year old, even if I didn't know anything about it. Um, and so kind of in parallel, like I was just aware of, of Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies in general. Um, you and, said that digital money just made, it made sense to you. It just kind of clicked right away. You think that has, you think just growing up in your, well, you're 20 years old now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just growing up in the younger generation, not that we're that much older than you, but I think in this digital age that we live in, people that are, you know, 25 years and younger just intuitively understand that digital items can have real value. Do you think, can you speak to that a little bit? How is, how do you think your generation views um, money differently from maybe people that are in their thirties, forties and older than that? Do you think that you guys have like a leg up on this whole digital value proposition? Yeah, totally. And like, you know, not even getting into like how a unit of dollars is created versus a unit of Bitcoin or a crypto, like not even getting into any of that, like natively, like money to me is like, or to my generation is like, Venmo, right? It's like, oh yo, Ven yeah. Venmo me ten bucks, man. Like, like I don't, like I don't use cash at all, and it's not because I'm like this Bitcoin guy. It's just because like no one uses cash, right? It's like Apple Pay, Venmo, like digital digital tra transfer of value just makes sense to everybody. And so like, you know, even if I knew nothing about it, it's like cryptocurrencies, internet money. It was like, okay, like yeah, you know, what about it? Yeah. Um, and you know, that doesn't mean I'm buying it or not. It just it just like was something that if I'm you know. 50 years old and in the, you know, on wall street or, you know, rehearsed in Keynesian economics for the last three decades. Like right. I, I, you know, Bitcoin, like digital money, what is this? Like pyramid yeah. scheme. But huff, like huff. for me, I, yeah, <laughs> I wasn't dismissive of it. Cause like, I didn't even know what I didn't know. And so, um, you know, at the same time as I'm kind of learning, uh, you know, just about investing in general and finance and economics and, and trying to figure out how everything works. I'm just like aware of Bitcoin and I'm aware of cryptocurrency. Um, and, you know, I had a Twitter account and that I would just use for like sports or whatever that I made like when I was, I don't even know, like 13 years old. And so I, I, you know, I luckily stumbled upon Twitter and looked up Bitcoin and crypto, I guess. And I, I pretty early found like somewhat of a looking back on it. I didn't know it was a maximalist crowd, but I found like a maximalist crowd, um, which, you know, <laughs> obviously is like super helpful. Yeah. Um, and kind of just, you know, like when my, my 18th birthday, I bought, I bought some Bitcoin, not because I knew what it, <laughs> you know, why the, like the value prop, I didn't know. It just like, all right, well, I'm gonna get my hands on some of this stuff. And that was, um, right around, I think two weeks after that, that was the bottom of the, the bear market. I bought like my first Bitcoin, a couple hundred bucks, like 3000 and watched it 4X in that summer. Yeah. And I was like, what the hell is this thing? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. What's well, interesting though, I mean, you're a huge Dalio fan. Dan and myself have read, I think just about everything Dalio's put out and being able to have the confluence of young enough to, to natively understand digital money or digital value and then read Dalio and kind of be able to uh, dovetail those two together in your mind with new eyes, you know, as a younger person, it makes sense very intuitively. Whereas I think even Ray Dalio himself has said he's, he's made comments on Bitcoin and he's even said he may be wrong about it, but he's, it's almost like, uh, you're mentally solidified at like 35, 40 years old. And after that, changing your mind about things that you've believed in for a long period of time becomes substantially harder. I, th I think that might be some of the the issue that older people in wall street and just older people in general have about grokking this entire situation. I was going to say, there's this aspect of like, you got to be careful of number go up in the sense that I, I think I tweeted something yesterday. Cause we, we had all this whole move during this, whatever this, whether this was the start of the bear market or a blip, it's looking more like a blip right now. You, you, people started, you know, dollar cost average, have a long-term time horizon. But now that the price is going, you know, starting to move vertical again, people are shedding that. And I just said as a reminder, like, hey, boys and girls, this is exciting. Like, I like seeing the number go up too, but hatch a 10-year plan, not a 10-day plan, right? Yeah. My point here was that, back to price, it, it is important though, like to, to draw people in, it's this just unbelievably powerful magnet. Kind of like what you were saying, if you really don't know what's going on in this space, 
and you make a purchase and you see this thing do something that you you didn't know was possible, you know, just orders of magnitude, it has a way of motivating you to learn, to understand and to grow. So yeah, I am cautious, like, hey, don't get too wrapped up in that. But if that's something that can draw someone in and cause them and give them motivation to learn and understand, all the power to them. Yeah, price is like the ultimate kind of truth, right? Like, like Bitcoin, you know, the the kind of the mark of its success is the price going up. And like, you know, like if someone's like doesn't know anything about that and they say, you know, it kind of sounds like we're some zealots. And we're like, oh, the price is up. We're right. You know, like and they're just like, oh, it's a bubble. But um, ultimately for like this monetary network, right, it's like with, you know, some people try to use like um, like Metcalf's law where it's like the value of a network is like the square of its users. And like, that's true for like maybe Facebook or like, you know, the telephone or, but, but Bitcoin doesn't scale per user. Bitcoin scares, scales per, you know, unit of, of monetary energy as like Michael Saylor would call it or something yeah. that's stored on this network. Right. You know, Elon Musk or Michael Saylor bringing a billion dollars of value is, you know, even though it's, it's, it's great when, when you have 10,000 plebs that are, buying 10 bucks, you know, if, if, some, if Ray Dalio comes in with his $40 billion hedge funds, like, Hey, like I'm not buying bonds and I'm going to allocate 20% of this fund to Bitcoin for the next decade. Like, you know, that's that Bitcoin scales, you know, more yeah. than just one user at that point. That's a great point. Yeah. Plus, this is where I think just looking at the underlying of like, how is the network growing? How is participation growing? Th that's the part where the tulip mania thing really doesn't add up. It's like shed price and just say, look at the, the, the explosion in participation that especially when you zoom out to two or three year time horizons just keeps churning forward. I mean, the network has doubled in participation in the last like six months. And you're saying this is a bubble that's about to implode. It, it almost makes you want to just rack your head against a wall. Yeah. I don't think that anyone who's, a, you know, I've heard in 2017, the tulip comparison was pretty prevalent. I haven't heard it so much this cycle. And I think people are starting to understand it's not so much that, especially when you, we've watched this thing have, I was at four of these giant bull markets. Now the tulip mania was one giant, you know, spike. And that was it. Like people realized that oh, this blue and white tulip isn't worth the price of a house and it never will be. And that was dead. And it's been dead for hundreds of years now. Tulips didn't have four year cycles where they went up again and like quadrupled the price and on and on. It's just a crazy comparison to be making anymore. All right. So Dylan, take your story now from 2018. So you've made your first purchase. You've you're dabbling. Take us from that point now to today on your journey. Yeah, man. So at that point I was, um, let me think I was in high school. Um, what year? Jeez, I'm bad at math. Um, I was, I was a senior in high school at that point. No, I was a junior in high school, um, just kind of learning. Had a summer job. I was buying Bitcoin. You know, I was like also buying like stocks or whatever. Um, and I'm learning, right? Like, and I and I start listening. I think I I was listening to like Pomp's podcast, right? Like the the kind of the the normie like entry and like you know the typical like entry points. Um, and was like pretty blown away. Like it, I didn't. It was a lot of it was over my head. But like, I was like, okay, well, it seems like a lot of really smart people in the know are like super, super, super excited about this. Mm. And so like, you know, I got to, you know, don't trust verify. I got to learn what they're talking about. But, you know, like this doesn't seem like it's, it's too, it, I mean, it, it seems too good to be true in the sense that like these people are talking like this is, you know, going to, you know, a hundred X in value at a minimum, but what they're saying, it adds up. like. Like, it's not just like, there's not no substance behind it. There's, there's, you know, what they're saying and, and I'm, I'm trying to figure this out. It, it sounds true. And so, um, I was doing a lot of learning. Um, I was in high school, not really paying attention in a lot of my classes, but doing good, um, and decided I was going to go to, to business school, um, to kind of study like finance and economics because, um, you know, I, I knew college wasn't like, I knew that it wasn't the do all end all, but I, I understood that. Um, it, it's kind of hard. Like everybody does, like everybody goes. Um, and, and like, yeah. if you d didn't go to school in just, uh, you know, my high school, but in general, like you're a pariah, it, right? It's like odd. It's like, why, you know, like, Oh, I'm sorry. You're not going. 
And so, and so I, I was like, all right, well, you know, I'll go to my hometown school. Um, I'm, I'm in, located in Vermont right now. I went to the University of Vermont, like 10 minutes from my house. Um, I got good grades in high school, good, you know, great test scores, whatever. Like, wasn't, didn't cost an arm and a leg at all. And it's partially why I went in state. Um, like, you know, Vermont's pretty beautiful. Um, and so I was like, all right, we'll study economics and finance there. Um, and had a, had an awesome first year at, at business school, but, um, you know, we got sent home in March and at the same time, like I'm in school and like learning some classes were great. Some classes were pretty dumb where like, we're learning straight up Keynesian propaganda, you know, like 2% inflation is good. Well, why is it good? Uh, because the textbook, yeah, I mean, that's essentially how it went. And so, you know, at the same time, like I, I was, I was listening to like the press and piss podcast and I read the Bitcoin standard and I was listening to like, you know, pomp and I'm on Twitter just like kind of lurking. And I like, I was learning all this awesome stuff for free. And my college was my, like, it was a blast, like hundred percent of blast. And I, I did learn some stuff, but they sent us home in March because of COVID. And um, you know, at the same time, like I'm, I'm pretty, you know, falling down the economics rabbit hole at this point. Um, and they sent us home the stock market tanks. And I like, it was, it was just kind of a crazy couple of months where like, I realized that the, the financial system was, was messed up. I read Jeff Booth's book about technological deflation and education trending towards no cost, and how information was free and abundant. And I was like, that's yeah, me right we now. We just had Jeff li- on I'm last listening. week. Yeah, it's an incredible book, The Price of Tomorrow. Incredible. It's, a, it's an incredible book. And it was like, it, it made me question more than I ever had before. I'd always kind of thought like, you know, why am I paying, you know, and I'm not paying an arm and a leg like, like some people or someone out of state might, but why am I paying to listen to this boomer on a Zoom call when on my other tab, <laughs> I'm on Twitter and I'm on, I'm on people, you know, literally world experts at whatever this is and they're posting their thoughts for yeah. free. And it was like, okay, well, and it really made me question that. And at the same time, like, I really t- took the orange pill hard and I was reading Dalio's books about like debt cycles and whatever. And then the Fed print, like, you know, the Fed was like, all right, we're buying corporate debt and we're going to, you know, yeah, the basically, insanity. and like, you know, the money printer go burn me and was like, you know, kind of came out. And I was, it was just like, whoa, like, I, yeah, Bitcoin, there's nothing else that matters. Like, I need to drop out. Like, I don't even have a plan. I don't have a plan at all. It was like, I can't go to school. Like, it just doesn't, doesn't make sense. And so, uh, dropped out and just picked up a, a manual labor job and was like, all right, well, I'm going to start stacking. Um, and you know, that's kind of, you know, we can talk about what happened after that, but if you want to hop in and ask a question, every, every Bitcoiner has this same moment where you just go, holy fuck, I need Bitcoin right now, not tomorrow, not next week. And the funny thing, like on Twitter, you know, Josh and I are trying to like mentor people through this, people we work with, whatever. It's like, Dollar cost average, be patient. And it's true, but I'm going to speak yeah, out of the other tell side them of my buy as much as you can. There is a moment yeah. where you kind of put these pieces together. And I resonate with a ton of what you just said um, it, as a background. So Josh is in, we both got involved in 2017, Josh before me, and he's the one that really pushed me into it. I felt like I had enough of a position. Like it was a reasonable position. Like, hey, this is, this is the allocation I want in my portfolio, whatever. We kind of, there's a moment, you know, it's, it's progressed for me over the last four years, learning more and more, but especially like even at the beginning of this year, when they, when that printer went off, I, it, it, you didn't know the, what was possible. I think for me during COVID, you're paying attention to these macro econ dynamics and what the feds up to and the balance sheet and the, the phenomena of QE since the recession. But the amount that that thing spit out during COVID really was kind of the last puzzle piece. And I remember reaching a point where I made some significant purchases at the beginning of this year, just that there's this legitimate panic of like, I need more Bitcoin and I need it right now. And it sounds like that's kind of what you had. Like you're sitting in college, listening to these boomers on Zoom and you're like, I got to find a way to make money. I forget which podcast was it was on, but I think you said you were doing like electrical work for your family or some shit. Just like, I got to get, <laughs> yeah. to, I got to free up some cash here to start stacking this stuff or else I'm going to get railroaded. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was kind of funny. Like, you know, I, like, I did well in school and like, I like was for the most part, like aced all my like business classes or you know, econ classes. And I saw people, uh, in September, you know, I, like I was, I was living back down there, but I was, I was working. 
Um, and they're like, oh, like, how's class XYZ going? And I'm like, oh, man, I, I dropped out. And they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, uh, working, working electrical and buying Bitcoin. And they're like, <laughs> dude, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and there was, yeah, it was just like kind of this moment for me. I was like, holy hell. And I, I think Preston Pish, uh, Travis Kling, um, and a couple other like like macro, but also Bitcoin guys, like really like kind of, and like Lynn Alden when she kind of like yeah. published, oh, I think man. she came out and she's one of the, she's one of the best thinkers. For and sure. like also like Raul Powell, who's like kind of went down like the, the digital <clears throat> asset kind of path. He's still a is, genius you know, though. Yeah, he is. Yeah. We, we align and completely like just there. The, yeah. Like Raul, like we're like, ah, he's a little bit of a shit coiner, but he's such a genius. It's like, you still got to yeah. listen to this dude. He had a video last October where he literally said he's going all in on Bitcoin and he's, his net worth is substantial. He made a lot yeah, of money. And, and he was like, and he was like in, in February of 2020 or like January, February, he was kind of one of the ones that I kind of they like made me click like the, the macro kind of thing where like. Okay, like what is what does debt mean for an economic system? How is it resolved? Where's like what's the path forward here? Um, and and it was just like okay, wait. So we're in this like eighty year you know debt super cycle. That you know this this is like a demographics thing. This is an economic thing. This is like most people are looking at this month to month, year to year, even decade to decade. And like this is much bigger than that. Like we haven't even lived. No one yeah. alive has lived through what's happening. Right. And so and then there's there's this new alien technology just dropped on the world that's through human incentives is just is just a wrecking ball and and it's just pulling people in and and they're never leaving. And like and for me I was like it's like kind of that, you know, game theoretic, you know, uh moment where you're like I have to play. Like I I don't have a choice to play. Like I have to play. And the playing yeah. is like acquiring as much bitcoin as you possibly can. Yeah. And so like Took on, <laughs> took on all of the debt I possibly could. <laughs> bought Bitcoin, like, 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 like straight up, like, bunch of credit cards, zero percent, eighteen months. Complete degenerate, the, like, dude. I love it. <laughs> irresponsible stuff. People are like, are you crazy right now? I'm like, dude, it's it's risky to not do this. So I saw your tweet yesterday about uh, the options contracts of the year. They were expiring in 21 and and then December 22, right? Can you talk about that yeah. a little bit? Because that's something I haven't really dabbled in, and I don't think a lot of our listeners have. Could you kind of break down your thoughts on uh, why you chose those, and then just options contracts in general, just for a minute, just to give us all a good education on how you approach that, how you think about um, buying, and why you would choose those dates? Yeah, so um, I mean, so I, I bought some like over the past month when we kind of went to like low 30s, um, you know. 50 60 percent off the all-time highs um i had been i i buy bitcoin every day i have since basically my 18th birthday but um you know especially now like working at bitcoin magazine <laughs> make make better money than i did at uh doing electrical work <laughs> um and so i you know i bought a lot in the in the you know 40 to 64 thousand range and like not that that worries me. You're like, I'm underwater. I don't care. I'm just stacking. Yeah. Um, and I don't really place a dollar value on it. But um, for for tax purposes, because of like how kind of crypto works, you know, Bitcoin crypto, um, you can wash trade essentially. So like you could straight up sell the Bitcoin you got and buy it back and you get you can get a, a capital loss. Um, and for most people, like I, you know, options, futures, like for me, like I, so I cover um, for Bitcoin magazine, I, they have a premium newsletter. Um, and like, they asked me to, to, to head this, uh, when was it May, I believe, uh, um, this is the yeah, deep dive middle right? of May. Yeah. We'll, we'll, li we'll link it in the show notes for people too. Cool, man. Yeah. Um, and, and they, they've been wanting to do this for a while apparently, um, and, and had never really had, um, maybe not the personnel, but just, uh, the resources for it, I guess. Um, and so the deep dive is kind of it covers like global macro and then also like derivative markets and on-chain stuff. And like, I'll, I will just be completely transparent for most people, like, like just stack Bitcoin, you know, get on Swan or river or wherever cash app buy a little every day. And like, if you want to follow the markets, if you want to like, you know, all this stuff, like some people find it super fascinating. That's awesome. And like, this is the product for you if you like that. But for most it's like, you know, produce an income, chill out and just save money for mm -hmm. yourself. And like, yeah. that's it. Like options, you know, arbitrage trades, all this stuff. Like, 
you know, there is a risk. There is kind of like you, you can go incrementally out on the risk curve, but like, don't, don't over leverage yourself or like, don't do, you know, if you don't really know what you're doing, like just stack and it's a guaranteed win. Um, so just kind of prefacing with that, um, I do like, uh, I mean, you know, a premium markets newsletter where I'm not giving like trading signals or at all, but you know, more of just covering like kind of market dynamics, like what happened with grayscale or something, right. Where like, well, like what, what was that earlier in the year and why did grayscale buy like 200,000 Bitcoin in the middle of this like huge bull run? Um, cause there was like, you know, there's, there's a trust and it, and it doesn't trade like an ETF, um, to net asset value, like within and outflows. You can essentially there's a secondary market for GBTC and retail was bidding the hell out of it. And so because of that, it was trading above NAV. So as an investor, you could go up to Grayscale and you could give them a hundred bucks. And if Grayscale, if GBTC was trading at a 30% premium, they would give you thirty $130 of GBTC shares that would be locked up for six months. So essentially as like an institutional investor, it was like a no brainer. It's like, yeah, it's all right, I'm just going to pummel cash into this. And so like, you know, that was just an example, but that's kind of what I, I cover for um, for the deep dive, just like stuff like that. So for these options trades, um, you know, I I can like look at um, with some of the tools and, and suites I have, like probabilities of of certain you know prices at certain dates um, from the option market. And what like what they were saying at thirty thousand in in in, uh, in July was that uh, there was like less than a one percent chance of Bitcoin being hundred thousand in twenty twenty one. And at the same time, I'm seeing um, like there's kind of this divergence of, um, in, you know, in the data where like the price action was super ugly, but on chain, you could see like a massive amount of accumulation, basically like coins being, being swooped up just at a, at a massive scale. And then, and like everybody in the derivatives market, you know, on Binance and all this stuff were leveraged shorting Bitcoin with like stable coins. Like they didn't even have Bitcoin to short. They were just. And so there was this kind of like, you know, this doesn't happen much, but like this huge divergence between like traders who are like leveraging um, their their stable coins, not even real Bitcoin, were super bearish and all, and like spot buyers, sat stackers were super, super bullish. And so I, you know, I took about a 2%, 3% uh, you know, percentage of my stack, all of, all of which I bought from, you know, 30, 35 to 60,000. Um, and I sold it for a loss and, and bought call options, which are dollar denominated. Um, unfortunately, like it, it's not on Deribit or something where it's like all Bitcoin denominated and I will have to pay some sort of tax on this. Um, but bought call options um, for December 2021 and December 2022 from 50 to 150,000, um, you know, all in between. And so um, those have, I think, two or three X um, since then. Which is which is good, oh, yeah, um, you know. Dude. It's like yeah, that's okay. It's it's something, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's it's like you know, it's a small part of my stack, and I and I went into it kind of with complete like you know understanding that is a speculative trade, right? And that yeah. like and a know, small percentage of your portfolio, sending, buying Bitcoin and sending it to cold storage and sitting on it for a, like a decade is the strategy, and it's what and it's like and and that. Overall, it's like over a hundred percent of my net worth is doing that strategy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like I literally, I literally indebted uh, to do that. So, um, you know, I, I would say that. But I, you know, I also have taken a small kind of speculative position in the call options, and as well as like Bitcoin miners, um, you know, publicly traded ones, which during bull markets, you know, can go absolutely berserk. One interesting thing. This is to go back a couple minutes, but. The perception of Bitcoin from a lot of people is that it's obviously that that haven't done the research. It's complete idiocy and total speculation. Where I see Bitcoin contradicting that, though, is that for a lot of people, this phenomena instills financial fitness and discipline that they've never had in their life before. Like you, you were kind of hinting at that some too. Like, oh, you need you need an income stream. And you have to save some of your income stream for 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 an asset that could go up in value. Like that's a phenomena that a lot of millennials, Gen Z, and obviously we could go up the generations too, are just totally haven't wrapped their head around that idea, and they're just levering up to buy complete crap. We actually talked about this with Jeff Booth last week. We were talking a little bit about how leverage is is really bifurcating. Like if you're levering up for the right reason, you can take advantage of these unbelievably artificially low yields 
But if you're levering up for the yeah. wrong reasons, it can absolutely and completely fuck you. So it's just it, it, hearing your story. Obviously, if you're not a Bitcoiner, you think you're a total degenerate. But from our perspective, we're like, <laughs> no, this dude, this dude sized up the situation and is, has implemented a strategy with a lot of discipline and intention that's going to pay off. And you, you see that for some of your peers, like, yeah, I, I feel like this it, Bitcoin has a way of doing this to some people where it just plain and simple teaches them to save money. Yeah, I've I mean, I personally, Orange pulled a lot of my friends. So like, you know, my college buddies over the summer of, of 2020, like, you know, I, I know like I have a bunch of broke college buddies who may or may not have like over one Bitcoin in cold storage that they have no plan on selling. And, and meanwhile, like currently like are near broke eating ramen noodles and haven't touched a single Satoshi. Right. And, and they're like, this is my generational savings account. Yeah. And so, <laughs> you know, that's powerful. And the fact that like, you know, if, if anything hits the fan, you have this, this safety net. And like, I think with Bitcoin, once you kind of grasp it or, you know, you have somebody in your ear, like it sounds like kind of what happened with you two and, you know, what's happened with me and a bunch of my family and a bunch of my friends, you are that annoying Bitcoin guy until they get a position and it goes up or until it, something clicks. And then it's like, wait, there's a huge opportunity cost to everything I'm spending. And like with fiat, most people like that, you know, they're, Financial literacy is a problem, 100%. But because there's this kind of, I don't know, like systematic, just like degradation of value in, in your savings, like, like that people don't understand opportunity cost. Yeah. Is the, the high time preference thing and that saving talks about, it's so true. Like, you know, I, like for me, like I didn't think about opportunity cost much for college because it was what everyone did. But then once I got Bitcoin, it was like, college is way too expensive. I can't, you know, and not even the, 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 the money, it was the time. And like, you know, there's a big flip there. Right. Yeah. That, that's a great point with time. I mean, look at what you, you, to butter your muffin a little bit here. I mean, you're, yeah, you're killing it. I mean, you, you, you could be, you know, and it's not like classes are bad. I don't want to completely malign the education system, but if you've got a talent and a niche and an avenue, they don't come around all that often in life. Sometimes you have to grab the bull by the horns and seize an opportunity. And that's clearly something you've done this year. Appreciate it. I think that financial literacy is, I agree with you on that point. There's so many people that just have no grasp of macro econ whatsoever. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind just kind of giving your quick synopsis of your Dalio-esque um, macro outlook and why you think Bitcoin is the answer to that equation. Yeah, so um, this was this kind of clicked for me when I when I read. Um, I mean, there's so there's a 30 minute YouTube video which is really really good. It's called How the Economic yeah. Machine Works. Yep, um, everybody should watch it. Yep. And like I tell people, um, it's like you know you'll probably learn more about that than you will like for most economics courses or whatever. We'll link um, that it just too. Cuts through all the noise. Yeah, and, incredible video. Yeah, it's great. A lot of great graphics and it, and it really just contextualizes where we are. Um, in an easy to understand way for people that aren't even really well versed in, in economics. Um, but essentially like you have, you have um, with, with fiat currencies, but really um, with kind of how monetary systems are structured, you have like debt cycles because debt in like the most basic way is cyclical where um, not only like if I borrow money from you, not only am I borrowing from you, but I'm borrowing from my future self. I'm pulling forward demand and I have to pay that back. I have to pay that back in the future with interest because there is some sort of time value of money. Um, at least <laughs> There, there should be. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, like I don't, I'm not going to lend you money to get back the same amount in the future. There's going to be some sort of rate, which um, I need to part with that. Um, and so, you know, if you borrow money, you are, are basically paying with your future, um, you're paying with your future productivity. And so that's like true at an individual level, but it's true like a, at, a, at a macroeconomic level, it's true, you know, for, for sectors at large, um, you know, economies, global, domestic, et cetera. And so um, you have these kind of these, these cycles where, um, you know, there's, there's short term debt cycles where, you know, there's kind of boom and busts where um, if you borrow money, you pull forward demand, um, you can invest that, you can spend, you spend another person's income rises, um, asset values go up because people are borrowing to, to, to invest and whatever. And there's, there's kind of like a native understanding, even if people don't understand economics or, you know, macro that like, oh, you know, there's boom and bust cycles. There's a business cycle. There's a recession. Like people get, people kind of get that. Maybe they don't know why it happens. Um, but I think 
kind of coming to the understanding that that recessions don't happen because all of a sudden the world got less productive, but because of um, there's an underlying credit cycle, there's there's a boom and bust associated with with debt and credit dynamics, where when you pull forward demand, eventually the piper has to be repaid. Um, debt to income ratios rise too large. Um, you know there has to be some sort of uh, you know repayment there, and so you know you pay back the debt. Your income is your spending is another person's income, and there's this kind of reinforcing loop on the way up of a of a you know a boom of a credit cycle, as well as a bust. Um, and so this kind of happens, and you can see this like even though the rates are centrally planned, you can see this with like central bank set interest rates. Um, you know where they try to use this lever to to um, ease a business cycle. That's kind of what Keynesian economics is based on. It's we're going to use you know our economic policy to to stimulate the economy. And so every time over the last over the last 50 years or over the last 40 years, every time there was kind of um, debt to income ratios got too high, there was kind of this bust, well, the Fed and global central banks would step in and kind of use their their lever to to ease the situation. And so we've had, you know, five or six of these boom and busts. And over the course of, of that period, every time the cost of capital has gone lower um, to kind of to to facilitate you know, more, more spending, more investment to really, it's kind of a way of kicking the can down the road. Um, that level has never really reset. And so um, since 1981, rates have gone from 20% to, to 0% today. Um, and so there's this, you know, really now debt levels are so high that there's, there's no way to, to repay it, or there's no way to get, I guess, lower the cost of capital any further. There's no way to kind of, to, to keep this thing going, except to to basically print money, and I'm I'm skipping over kind of a lot of the nuance and process here, um, but at this stage of a debt cycle, there's there's you know either if central banks and and governments didn't intervene, there would be the biggest collapse of all time. Bank the banking system would go insolvent, the markets would draw down ninety percent plus, um, because with how fiat currency works, when I when I if I'm a commercial bank and you deposit money. And I lend that money back out into the economy. Money's created, and like the, you know, most people like that's kind of sounds crazy. Like banks create money, but that's true. Commercial banks create money through lending, and a lot of people don't like people don't understand where does a dollar come from. Oh yeah, the government. The, people's lack of understanding for what a fractionally reserve system is is crazy. And that's kind of another red pill, right? right. Where like how the fractional reserve system works and where, where it originated. But you know, going if you look at the 1930s, it was fractionally reserved gold, right? But um, you know, with a, with a kind of a lot of events happening in between, we're now at a fractionally reserved fiat system, right? So, so money is created through lending, but it's also destroyed if there's default or repayment. So when you pay back that loan, right? Or like, you know, if I'm a bank and I have a deposit and I lend you out a hundred bucks plus interest, I now have a hundred dollar asset on my balance sheet or, you know, or 105 if there's, you know, interest or whatnot. And you have hundred dollars in cash and a hundred and five dollar liability or whatever it is, right? And so so that inherently created money. And so if all of a sudden you default on your on your repayment, me as the bank, you know, the asset that I thought I had disappears. And so now their money was destroyed in that process. And so I'm less likely to lend. I am less likely to repay back any money I owe. And there's this kind of there's this whole collapse all the way down in this debt cycle, unless there's, you know, some sort of intervention. And so kind of on a macro level, that's been happening for, for 40 years in the sense that every time there's this kind of deleveraging event, the Fed, global central banks step in to, to boost it all back up, to keep this kind of the, this, the musical chairs, right. keep, to keep the music playing. So yeah, the risk is just aggregated to the sovereigns eventually, like the, they're basically taking on the risk of the entire system and the risk is now in the monetary system itself. Not in the yeah, commercial yeah. banking system. That was like a Foss the Boss quote in his piece. I think it was the one that ended up in Bitcoin Magazine. Like in the in the Great Recession, going back 13 years, what happened was the movement of debt from and risk from the financial sector to the sovereign balance sheet is basically basically what occurred. I love the simplicity, but the truth behind that that statement. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's now it's it's systematic where. Um, through each kind of essentially bailout, and you know, some people will say, "Oh, it's not a bailout," or quantitative easing doesn't print money, or all this stuff. But yeah, essentially, now in the in the debt cycle, there's there's two options. Um, you know, from a from a central bank's kind of 
perspective. It's let everything unwind and, and collapse on your watch or print our way out. And essentially, I mean, and that's oversimplification, but essentially, yeah. like Foss says, in that situation, the error term is the currency. The, the current, the value of the currency is how you solve this debt equation, right? So like he has, Greg has a great piece and this is one, another one of my kind of like, whoa moments where I had never really done the math around it, but he's saying, okay, well, global debt to GDP is 400%, okay? Yeah. And so, you know, if we, if we just simplify this and just, you know, you can use any, you know, coupon, any interest rate you want, but just say the average interest rate is 3%. And so like, you know, if you're lending money, 3% is like not great, but we'll just, just call it that. And so the average interest rate on 400% debt to GDP is 3%. Well, that means that by default, the debt level grows by 12% a year. And so just to keep pace with the debt load, the global economy has to grow by 12% a year. Well, newsflash, that's not happening. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> um, and especially because of, you know, if you go back to, you know, you're, you said you interviewed Jeff Booth, well, what is he talking about? He's talking about technological deflation and the fact that this world now, productivity doesn't come with increased number go up GDP. It comes with actually number go down. Everything's driving the cost of things <laughs> lower. And so, so how does this play out? Well, it plays out where you, the central banks, governments around the world, to keep everything glued together, have to print unfathomable amounts of money. And we're like just at the beginning phases of this. And so, you know, in traditional long-term debt cycles, like Dalio talks about in the 1930s, and it was more of a private debt bubble, but he has, you know, a bunch of debt cycles that he studied throughout the course of history. And in every single one of those, the place you wanted to be was essentially, I mean, you know, you had kind of commodities or other things, but don't hold debt, don't hold bonds. Equities do well in nominal terms, meaning like, you know, the, the dollar value or whatever value goes up, but in real terms, you're losing purchasing power. But you really want to be holding gold because there's two reasons. One, they can't print gold. Two, gold doesn't have counterparty risk, right? So like if there is a huge deleveraging event and everything in the banks collapse, if you're sitting with gold in your basement, not with gold in the bank vault, but you're going you're gonna to have your purchasing power protected. And so there was this kind of realization for me where like I was, you know, in February when I was still hadn't put it together in, in 2020. I was looking at like gold or gold miners. And then I, I kind of had this, this, this realization that like Bitcoin is gold on a monetary network perfected. Yeah. Gold is, is on an internet native network. It's gold perfected to absolute scarcity with the difficulty adjustment and all of this stuff. Like Bitcoin is this link between the physical and digital realm through like the laws of thermodynamics. And like that is like, the biggest mind blowing thing, like you can, it's the biggest epiphany you can have. Back in the yeah. 30s, Henry Ford had the idea, I think he even wrote an article on a newspaper about it, about monetizing yeah. energy or actually making energy money. He had an entire op ed about yeah. how this could solve so many problems in the world if money was simply measured in energy. And uh, that's basically what Bitcoin is doing, which is something I think so many people overlook and is so profound that we're actually looking at energy as money and uh, it's, yeah. it's and there's so many other moving parts behind it but that's what it boils down to in the end I and mean, this is like a, this is henry ford's idea from almost 90 years ago and we finally have the technology and somebody put all these parts together and and is making it work with all of these incentive structures built to incentivize people once they understand it to n not only buy more of it but they want to tell everybody about it because it's going to help their friends and family, you know, succeed in this kind of scary time. It seems we're moving into, uh, especially if you talk to Jeff Booth, we were just, I mean, oh. both of us were like, man, this, I mean, Jeff Booth is a great guy, a wonderful book, but man, I was trying to find some like sunshine in the, in that talk with him. Cause <laughs> I don't even know if, uh, I mean, uh, he's, he's worried about the future. And I think we all are, but I, and I think Bitcoin is a ray of hope for us. You know, I think what Booth, he incites this fear. But then it channels you the right direction because you're saying, what are the options to get out of this charade? There are not very many. So if one presents itself, get interested in it is basically yeah. what Booth is saying. Yeah. And um, yeah, there, there are not many ways to get out of this system. It's so, through what some of you are just saying, Dylan, there's a lot of people that are just confused about what's transpiring. Like, wait a second. Everything's shut down 
and the markets are going up and I'm money's appearing in my account. Like, but then the curiosity stops for a lot of people. I think the, and this is where going back to math is the key. It's like, they have to, we can point the finger. We can talk shit about the fed all day long. Josh and I have done it and we'll keep doing it. But to come to their defense, what are they supposed to do? This is one giant math problem. And they, they legitimately have no choice, but print tens to hundreds of billions of dollars a month just to keep this thing afloat because it is, it lacks all, all shock resistance. Like I forget on what podcast I heard recently, but it's like, you're just stacking blocks on top of each other. And if you, you know, in the beginning when there's just a couple blocks, you know, a hard stomp on the ground, the thing holds still, but now it's just, there's no shock resistance to the system. It's total sticks and bubble gum. Mm. And who the fuck knows what's going to cause the implosion and the deleveraging at this point. Um, yeah, it makes me, I, this is a really on the spot, tough question, but obviously the housing market, uh, caused the last unraveling. You have any inclinations, what you think might be the, the match that lights the whole thing on fire next go round. If we have a, an event like we had in 2008. Yeah, man. I, th- I mean, I think like, you know, in 2000, there was like this tech bubble, right. Where like, you know, their, their internet was a thing. Um, and there was, ev- and you know, there was this understanding that it was going to be very important, but people got, you know, ahead of themselves and they, you know, chased this, this huge IPO bubble and it all burst. Um, and then like literally like the fed, like Greenspan was like, all right, we have to, he literally was like quoted it. Like, I think in the fed minutes, he's like, yeah, we have to go blow another housing. We have to blow a housing bubble to get out of this. <laughs> um, and so, and you know, cause in Keynesian economics, there's this wealth effect, right? Like asset number go up. And people spend more and good for the economy, like very basic kind of <laughs> way of thinking. And so there was this housing bubble, right? And it popped. And now in 2020, 2021, like we're kind of in this, this everything bubble, right? We're like, and, and, and Bitcoin in, in like dollar terms is like part, part of this everything bubble where, while it's monetizing, right? Like in March, people in March of 2020, people were shitting on Bitcoin and they said like the Bitcoin experiment failed. If it said it was a hedge against the financial system and it went down, you know, 40% in a day. And that's like kind of missing the forest through the trees where it's, there's a huge liquidity crisis. Obviously Bitcoin's going to draw down, but what's the response after that? Right. And so I think what causes the bubble to pop? I don't know. I think, you know, it's Foss calls it like, you know, if there's one bad auction in the bond market yeah. where, you know, someone's like, Hey, I don't want treasuries at zero percent right or like or negative yield you know, there, there's so much money floating around there's there's a trillion dollars in the reverse repo operation meaning that there's so much liquidity going around the banking system that they're literally parking money a trillion dollars with the money at the fed to get five basis points 0.05 percent yield um and so like you know there's just all this liquidity sloshing around and you know it, it all it takes is the equity market to go down 10 percent 15 percent for this kind of a chain reaction to occur. Um, and so I, I don't think we're going to see a, a huge correction because they don't, they won't let it right. get there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so like, like, inevitably this is going to turn into, I mean, if they don't let corrections happen, as we said, the, this, the risk is all kind of into the currencies. I think we'll see potentially currency failures, probably smaller currencies first. It'd be a good canary in the coal yeah. mine for where this thing's going because as you said, without these corrections that kind of put things back onto a reasonable track, the risk just increases in the bond market and it increases in the currencies themselves. Yeah. And I think where, where Jeff Booth is right, um, and, and it's kind of scary, is that um, it transfers from financial risk to societal and political mm-hmm. risk, right? Where one of the kind of epiphanies that I had, this like 2020 was a huge orange pill, but also like a red pill moment for me where I was trying to figure out like went to University of Vermont, Vermont in general is super liberal, um, you know, for politically like, you know, Bernie, but also just kind of in general, like, it's like a very crunchy state, you know, like, you know, environmentalist, like all this stuff. And I'm not saying that's bad, but I was trying to like, you know, I have a solid head on my shoulders. I'm like, okay, like, you know, Trump's, Trump's a D bag, but I don't, I, I lean probably more conservative in the sense that like, you know, I don't, I don't think God, like, I was just trying to decipher this political movement. And I, and it was like, if you're a Trump fan, like in, in college and where I was going, you're a bigot, essentially. But I was like, I don't really, like, I don't like 
Joe Biden or, or whoever the, you know, candidate was at the time. I was like, I, how does this work? And then I like, you know, before I understood economics, you know, you have people like Bernie and they're like free college. And I was like, yeah, free, <laughs> Why free not? college, yeah. of course. Like, and, and then once I kind of understood that there's like no free lunch and then that was really kind of like a, a Bitcoin moment for me where it was like, okay, wait, there's no free lunch. And it's all just, this is basically like fiat literally means by decree. This is all political decree. And that this, the end stages of this debt super cycle of like, of, you know, and, and then I read, I also read the sovereign individual. I don't know if you guys have read yes, that book. That is right. a wonderful um, book. Yeah. <laughs> Mind blowing. Where it was like, it was like written in 1990 something. And it was talking about the fall of the nation state and like, you know, basically the internet empowering individuals to, you know, to opt out. And I was and that for me was like, Oh my God, like, and, and it literally predicted Bitcoin. It predicted all this stuff. It predicted um, kind of not like the rise of authoritarianism, but like how the, the, the last, you know, kind of stages of the nation state and the grasp for power and, and, and all of this stuff and how like financially it was all going to fracture. And for me, and then it was like, okay, wait, it's not about actors. That's what like, that's, that was a huge moment for me. It was like, it's not about Trump. It's not about Bernie or Biden or Stephanie Kelton or Jerome Powell. Or like, I was like, at first being an 18 year old and even at 20, like I'm still there. I, I still have a, a, you know, a long ways to mature, but it was like a big moment for me to realize that like, these aren't inherently like bad people. It's just individuals stuck inside of a system that they don't know any other, any other way out. Right. And like Bitcoin is now kind of this alternate system where once you see it, you can't unsee it, but 99% of the world hasn't seen it. Yeah. Right. And they're all stuck inside of this framework where you're right. There's 40% of Americans are dead broke and they need help, but why? Right. And like, like, and if they stop quantitative easing and if they stop boosting the stock market, well, yeah, it will be extremely bad for people that are unemployed. It will be extremely bad for people on the bottom of the pyramid. But guess what? So is keeping the system alive, right? Like there, there are no, it's like, it's all yeah. just trade-offs yeah. and there are no like, you know, easy decisions here. And it's, you know, it's just kind of, it's an unstoppable force meeting in a movable object here, yeah, you know, yeah. and it's just, what are the fireworks <laughs> going to look like when these two objects meet really? And I think we're, we're starting to see just the beginnings of that, what's going on in the Senate right now and with them, you know, putting language in this bill, burying them in a thousand page bill that is, I mean, just shows their lack of understanding for what is going on and how these regulations that they want to, that they're going to pass are going to have no real effect on anything. Even if they shut everything down in the United States, this doesn't end anything. Just like the mining uh, in China ended mining in China, but it's, it's going to proliferate everywhere else in the world, anyone that takes it. And the game theory that's going to play out is going to be advantageous for whatever country decides that El Salvador could be positioned to, to be something insanely more powerful than they ever thought they would be 10 or 20 years from now because they're just opening their arms up to all this technological innovation that is going to come pouring in when, when these big dumb dinosaur states are kicking everybody out or the people that are going to be bringing value to the world. It's, it's just mind blowing yeah. to watch this happen. And on that note, I wanted to, I listened to Eric Voorhees yesterday and this was a great episode on McCormick. He was talking about uh shapeshift and how they're turning it into a DAO, uh, a, an autonomous organ, digital autonomous organization. They're going to turn this entire company into, because they're getting regulated into things they don't want to do like KYC. He's decided to just completely negate the organization of a business um, the way they have existed traditionally, make it a digital autonomous organization so that he can avoid all of these pitfalls of regulators because you can't regulate something that is literally like Bitcoin decentralized and going to run itself. And it's, it's just, it's how this is going to pull the teeth out of these governments and regulators. They just don't even see it coming yet. You know, it's, it's wild. Yeah, it's like th this is bad. We we were before we started recording, Dylan. We were talking actually about the sovereign individual and, and in relation to this Voorhees episode and just these dynamics of where the power incentives are going to come from in our lifetime. And we were, we're already seeing a lot of this play out. Like there's this eerie feeling of reading that book where you like keep flipping back to the the cover and you're like, it can't be 1997, right? Like there's no way this book was written all the way back then. Like there's no there's like a, a prophetic nature to it. The way that, you know, 
the way these power incentives are going to work, it's just, this is where I sit back and I watch what's going on in the Senate. And I know a lot of people are concerned and, and butthurt. And I am too. Like, I wish they could just green light the heck out of this thing. But there's a, there's a part of me that just says like, it doesn't really matter. Like on a 10 or 20 year uh, zoom out lens, none of this is going to matter because Honey Badger's just going to keep on kicking. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think it's honestly, it was, it was awesome to see uh, Ted Cruz stand up there and, and say like, and I, the fact that this potentially can become a bipartisan thing is, is big. Um, where, whereas you have, you know, and, and not that I'm more red or Republican than I am Democrat or liberal. I don't care. I literally have a shirt. It's one of my favorite shirts. It's like, libertarian crossed out progressive crossed out conservative crossed out and it says bitcoiner and like that i 100 yeah. percent relate with that mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. when i when i had that like fixed when i had all these like epiphanies like we've been talking about in 2020 i was like yeah like i voting i didn't vote but vote didn't matter like i bought as much bitcoin as i could on november 3rd that's yeah. my vote like <laughs> that is a great you know, vote like, my friend there, that, politics politics don't move the needle and so um, you know, and like <laughs> this kind of illusion of choice that they present. Um, but you know, seeing kind of if if in 2024 you have the conservatives running on on freedom, on Bitcoin, on choice, and and then on the other side you have kind of the so called like liberals, right? Where it's like you know CBDC, Fed, like whatever it is, like centralized control. Well, there's a clear dichotomy there. And I think, you know, Bitcoiners are just kind of as Bitcoin monetizes and goes from 750 billion today to to 1 trillion to 5 trillion, Bitcoiners are going to be the most powerful class of people on the planet. And like tremendous amount of wealth. Right. Um, and, and, you know, you know, like wealth is going to be equated with Bitcoin. And that sounds crazy. Um, but I think this is this is just a start. And ultimately, like, yeah, it doesn't matter. I, I on Twitter yesterday after they passed this and and there was kind of debates about how substantial this was or if lightning nodes were included or not. And everybody's like up in arms because it's so vague. Right. And like, you don't like the Senate bill was, was vague on purpose. Right. Um, but I was like, drop a lightning invoice in the replies. I'll send you sats. And I had on this tweet, I had 400 replies and you know, I, I muted it after a while, but <laughs> I sent over the internet to, to 25, 30, Anons who had never met, who most of them had a fake name in their profile. I sent from you know a thousand to five thousand sats to these people with my lightning node routed over Tor, and nobody could do anything to stop it. And like, how are you going to stop that? Yeah, you're not. And that, yeah, like digital value over the internet that can't be corrupted, that can't be censored, that can't be diluted, that can't be stolen from me mathematically. Like, good luck, right? Like you're trying you. Tr- they can't stop drugs. They can't stop like yeah. the war on drugs is still going. They couldn't they couldn't stop alcohol. Like how are you going to stop information, right? There's just like that reality that when people are like what's the government going to do? And you're like, <laughs> "Yeah, man, like totally." And then <laughs> sounds like you got it all that's figured what, out. That's what most boomers have to say is what how is this that's what they think this is going to get banned by government and that's the hardest thing. Freeman, don't ask for heads. permission, my man. Like, <laughs> and then when you start thinking about just the jurisdictional arbitrage opportunities of the 21st century and the digital age, that holds a whole nother set of yeah. possibilities. Um, the two votes that matter: your feet and your money. The rest of them, the rest of it is nonsense. Yeah, and the reality is, like most of these Bitcoiners, like myself included, like you know, I'm living in Vermont. I'm living like at, at home at the moment for the summer, like. Literally, well, without shame, say living with my parents to stack more yeah. sats. I will no say shame, that. Man. But, you know, but like, you know, push comes to shove or even like this, this coming year, like I'm looking at three places down south and like, you know, Texas, Florida, whatever. And it's like, all right, I don't want to pay tax. I want to be in a, in a friendly jurisdiction and I can work remote. And like most people, most people, most like Bitcoiners or a lot of like, you know, digital natives, they have a skill set. They're getting paid with digital money and they're working remotely, right? Like I'm not beholden to uh, a jurisdiction. And if I'm not treated right, sovereign individual thesis, like I will leave and I'll leave with all the wealth in my head. <laughs> like, what are you going to do? Yep. Going back to some of the political stuff. And, and personally, this is Dan here. I, I, res- I am, I would consider myself in a lot of ways, a political moderate. Like if you took my votes, it's probably like 50, 50 on partisan lines. 
So I can talk out of both sides of my mouth here. And I definitely, I, I feel like a little bit of a political nomad because I identify with parts on both sides. But one thing, one theme that I think is worth exploring, and it's in your, your Bitcoin Magazine article, my favorite article you've written, the conclusion of the long-term debt cycle and the rise of Bitcoin, which we'll also link. You do an incredible job in this piece of synthesizing a lot of complex stuff that people can digest. You, you use a phrase in here, you say QE is socialism for the rich. And I think this next segment here is a message to, to oversimplify like liberals who have sort of a redistributive bent to them. I think a lot of them fail to understand how the current wealth gap and system is set up to completely railroad the lower and middle class. Can you enumerate some of what you mean by QE is socialism for the rich and how you see that playing out currently? Yeah. I think I think a lot of people, um, like personally, a lot of liberal friends, like like I'm sympathetic to them. Like they they like when you say I want equality or like you know like they're tax the rich or all this stuff. You know I I resonate and I I understand where they're coming from. Right, like there is systematically a problem. Um, Their motivation, the the root of that problem. Yeah, exactly. Their motivation is pure, Um, but the root of the problem is what they miss. It's it's kind of goes over their head and the fact that you know they're talking about. Like I have a lot of friends growing up in Vermont that are like Bernie fans and they're fans of quote unquote democratic socialism. Okay. And I'm like, I'm like, I think what you fail to understand here is we've, we've been doing socialism. <laughs> yeah. The, the rich have had their assets like, you know, boomers, if you look at like wealth shares, right? Boomers hold, and I don't know off the top of my head, but the, by far the most wealth out of anybody. Um, you know, compared to Gen X millennials and especially uh, Zoomers. Um, but, you know, you have, you have millennials who own, I think, 3% of the, the wealth in the U.S. And, and their parents, the boomers, at their, their, you know, the same age own 15 or 20 or whatever it was percent. And so, like, well, why is this happening? Well, every time there was, you know, a downturn, every time there was a crash, every time there was a deleveraging, we're, and we're, you know, going back to these debt cycles, well, what happened? Well, losses were socialized and they were socialized by a central bank. They were socialized, um, you know, through, through basically lowering the cost of capital. And so, you know, you have, you basically could have been a freaking a ham sandwich and you could have, you know, made a bunch of money from 1980 to, to 2021 by just leveraging up and, you know, sitting in your 60, 40 portfolio or buying real estate or whatever. And, and, you know, when rates go lower, well, guess what? Your asset value goes up. You can refinance. You can do all this stuff where like it's, you know, a lot of people, there's a lot of millionaires out there that are 65 and they're playing golf and they think they're rich because they're smart and not to discredit them. Like, you know, you played the game and you played it right and you won. Yeah. But, but the fact is the game was rigged in your favor and bravo for playing, right? Bravo. But it, it you know, riding, riding an asset, a secular asset boom while rates went from 20 to zero is not investing with skill it's riding you know a secular downtrend in the cost of capital and so, and so a lot of you know a lot of liberals who are talking about you know a wealth tax or whatever well okay you're going to you're going to get like and Jeff Booth articulates as well you're going to give them with one hand and then you're going to demand it back on the other to redistribute the wealth well now we're just going from you know socialism for the rich monetary socialism to socialism for all, which is even more of a disaster. Central planning does not work. And we've seen this throughout history. Um, and so, you know, I think if we see this kind of, if we see the more MMT style things happen, and I kind of suspect it, right? As yeah. as the wealth gap gets even worse over the next three years, what does the 2024 presidential candidacy look like? I don't know, but I imagine it's going to be even more of a collectivist kind of, um, you know, race yeah. going on, right? You're going to have you're going to have the Democratic candidate say, you know, you guys have been wronged and everybody's going to say, yeah, we have. And it's going to be an us versus them dynamic. Yeah, right? it always is. And it's and it's UBI. You're going to have, you know, whatever it is. Right. And and ultimately, that's just you're just kind of giving back a little bit of what you've taken. It's just instead of socialism for the rich, it's socialism for all. And you're going up against this hyper capitalistic, decentralized monetary network that's a you know, global phenomenon, it's ultimately all going to unravel. Um, but for the, for, you know, the, the liberals or the people that, you know, kind of want to address or right the wrongs, I think they're missing the bigger picture, which is the wrongs 
you know, have, have been there for decades and it's, and it's not a political phenomenon. It's a monetary phenomenon. Have you given any thought just thinking about the, the sovereign individual idea? What are some uh, indicators or some, some uh, landmarks you might think about for when it might be time to exercise that idea and, and leave? Have you thought about that at all? Or like where you might want to just leave the country potentially in the future? Yeah, I, I think there's going to be some sort of bifurcation and there already kind of is with like state rights, which is, you know, promising in the sense that like, you know, you have mm. people like, you know, tech, like Texas or, you know, like Florida and like people like DeSantis or whatever, where it's not even just about like, like tax regimes or whatever, but like vaccine passports and like not even to, to get into COVID. But, um, you know, I think there's, there's a pretty strong link between what's happening with COVID and what's happening with this global um, kind of effort to to kind of clamp down on individual rights and sovereignty into this kind of slow collectivist creep, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and like you know the the World Economic Forum and the Davos crowd and all this stuff like that's another rabbit hole in itself, yes, right? It <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, I think there's going to kind of be this jurisdictional arbitrage with states, um, and that's what kind of has me hopeful. But you know, what is that? You know, where does it end up? Well, any sort of wealth tax, um, you know, if there is this, you know, big deleveraging we're talking about or like, you know, crash, um, you know, economic crash, currency collapse. Does it happen in the next three or four years? I don't think so. But maybe um, I think ultimately the, the kind of maybe the scary thing is that Bitcoiners are villainized. Propaganda is strong. I've had that thought too. Right? Like propaganda is very strong. That this is the reason this all collapsed because of Bitcoin and they took all the wealth out of the these sovereign system. Yeah. These greedy Bitcoiners, these greedy Bitcoin hoarders yeah. crashed the system. I have actually thought quite a bit about how villainized this community could be in that, in that world. And it's really scary. This, yeah, it is a little scary. Yeah. It makes you want to cold store your shit and tuck it, <laughs> tuck it in deep for you sure. Put it in a Swiss yeah. vault. I hear that's the best place for your Bitcoin. Dylan, this has been awesome, man. Um, we could we could talk to you for another seven hours, but we won't. We know you got important shit to get to here today. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for your time and your perspective. Uh, it really has been a blast, man. Been fun, the guys. things. So we're gonna link. We'll link uh, your article I mentioned, uh, conclusion of the long term debt cycle and the rise of Bitcoin. We'll link the deep dive. I think I'm also going to throw, we mentioned this earlier, Dalio's video you alluded to. Uh, Other than that, give us a little plug on where people can find you and interact with your, your thoughts and material. Yeah. um, You can find me on Twitter. Um, You know, I just do, uh, do stuff with Bitcoin magazine. Um, So find me on Twitter at Dylan LeClaire or at uh, BTCization, Bitcoinization. (laughs) Um, Yeah. You know, just, you can find me there and uh, it was a lot of fun. I really appreciate you guys having me on. Dylan, it's been a pleasure. You're doing it right. Doing it right, brother. Stick with it. All the best to you. We'll talk again soon, my friend. See you guys. Peace. Peace. Thanks for listening into the show. If you enjoyed this discussion, be sure to subscribe on whatever app you're using for podcasts. And if you have an extra minute, go ahead and leave us a review. You can also follow us on Twitter. We're at blue underscore collar BTC. We invite questions, comments, and inquiries of any kind, and our email is bluecollarbitcoinpodcast at gmail.com. We look forward to you joining us next time on the Blue Collar Bitcoin Podcast.